I feel I'm being redundant at this point because I've said this now several times. I've, I grew up in church. This is all I've ever known. It's all I've ever known. And <clears throat> back when I was a kid, every church, at least in America, had uh, the custom that every Sunday we had testimony service. Every Sunday. And that was a portion of the service designated where the mic was open. Don't get any ideas. For anybody to come forward and talk. There's a reason we don't do it anymore. Bad idea. Something that lingered from the 80s and we cut it off. Thank God for the 90s where we finally cut the head off of that giant. You never knew what anybody was going to say. And people would come forward and they would testify. And sometimes we heard some of the funniest testimonies about things. I remember one particular testimony before God I'm not exaggerating a man got up and he said I want to thank the Lord um, he said I was driving home from work and as many of you know I'm I'm an undocumented immigrant I don't have a driver's license I don't have any kind of legal right to be driving a car but I needed to get to work and I was speeding and I was going 55 and a 35 um, br brothers and just the tears just, I, was, <laughs> I was just trying to get to work and all of a sudden I see the police behind me and I saw the sirens and I saw the lights and I began to pray and I said father I plead the blood I plead the blood over this car and I declare mercy I declare favor and, and the police pulled me over and I just started thinking oh God I need a miracle oh God and so I just started decreeing and declaring in the car oh God I know that you'll make a way where there is no way God I know that you'll do something for your child I am your son I'm a joint heir with Christ and I just so, and for the glory of God, I just want to thank God, church, that as that officer was approaching my car, right as he was getting to my car, two cars on the other side crashed right then and there. And the officer had to leave me and go there. And I want to thank God for favor. <laughs> we, we don't have time. For me to tell you, we heard a lot of funny things, a lot of crazy things. Sometimes wives or sometimes spouses would take the opportunity to do what we call in Spanish, indirectas. They would, you know, lanzar una indirecta. I want to thank God, you know, that even though this is my husband, you know, God did this. I mean, people would, so there, we just had to stop it. But in the midst of the craziness, there was legitimate, authentic testimonies of the goodness, the mercy, and the miraculous power of God. And the thing is that it was, it was electric. It was magnetic. One person would come and testify and say, I want to thank God. This week I was sick, like, like Pastor Steve talked about. And my son and God did this. And it was almost like it provoked someone else. And some, it was almost like popcorn in the sanctuary. And somebody else would pop up and get the microphone and say, I want to thank God that God did this for me. And then someone else would come and, well, and God did this for me. And we would stand or sit in awe at all that God had done. Because sometimes we feel like miracles are just these far off things that only happen once in a while. But when you come into, this is one of the, the reasons why it's so important to gather as believers. Because when we gather as believers and we hear each other's stories, we realize that God has been working miracles seven days a week, 365 days a year. This is a miraculous congregation. The fact that you made it, the fact that you woke up today. I can tell you, I can assure you today, you did not wake up because of an alarm clock. You did not wake up because your wife kicked you. You didn't wake up because, or your husband kicked you. Hopefully not. You didn't wake up because the dog was barking or the baby was crying you woke up because of the mercy hand of God that said I have another day for you and woke you up it's a miracle and there were Sundays where my father was never able to preach because the line of testimonies was so long that the testimonies were the sermon for the week and we heard all that God did and the thing is about a testimony when I hear your testimony the no here's two, there are two things that happen when some hear your testimony they get jealous in a bad way they get legalistic. They say, well, you don't deserve that. I've been in church longer. I tithe longer. My last name is. And don't judge me, but between you, me, and the Facebook audience, that used to be me. I used to hear someone get blessed and I'd say, Pff, they haven't been going to church as long as I do. They don't speak English and Espanol and Holy Ghost tongues. Hey. And a mentor, her name is Ann Jimenez, she said, Tony, God can't bless jealousy. He can't bless a bad attitude, but he blesses gratitude. So she said, when you hear someone get blessed, you say, thank you, Jesus. And then you say, me too, Lord. 
Because if we have the same father and he's been good to you and there are no favorites in the family, if he's been good to you, that means I'm next. So when I hear what God did for you and I hear how God blessed you, I say, thank you, Jesus. Now me too, Lord. Do it for my family. Do it for my children. Do it for my finances. Do it for my health. I want there to be a me too spirit here tonight. God, if you did it for everyone else, you'll do it for Inspire Church. You'll do it for the front row and the back row and the left and the right. Me too. So when I was pastoring in Virginia, there was this man in our church who was one of those crazy praisers, one of those Pentecostal, yeah, all right, you know what I'm talking about. I don't even have to show you. You know what I'm talking about. And one particular Sunday, there was a lady in our church named Sister Rosa. And God healed Sister Rosa of cancer. It was an auth it was authentic. It was, there was evidence. The doctor gave the report, wrote miracles. She was miraculously healed of cancer. And that service, everybody went crazy. Everybody except that guy. And after service was over, he came up and just kind of walked up to me like this. And he said, hi, pastor. I said, hey, man, you doing okay? He said, yeah, just, I just, I just wish I had one of those big testimonies. And I said, come again? Huh? He said, I just wish I had one of those testimonies like Sister Rosa. He said, man, if I had one of those big testimonies, I could travel with you. I said, it wasn't it wasn't computing I said what he said I just wish I had a testimony like sister Rosa's I said okay raise your hands please don't run out when I tell you what I did to him I said all right raise your hands I said father baptize him with cancer from the top of his head to the soles of his feet and he went karate kid on me he said hey hey hey, hey. what's your problem I said you said you wanted her testimony. He said, not like that. I said, oh, you want her victory, but you don't want her fight. You want to be able to talk about something that you've never lived through. I heard there's a, there's a preacher named G.E. Patterson in the United States. He says, salvation is free, but it ain't cheap. This praise that you saw tonight, this wasn't cheap. This shout cost us something. This worship cost us something. You don't know what it took for some people to be able to worship and raise holy hands tonight. This salvation, this miracle cost us tears. It cost us prayer. It cost us fasting. There was a price to be paid. And that's why when we step into the presence of God, nothing can hold back our praise and our adoration for our Father. For this was not a cheap praise. Every testimony that exists comes out of a test. Every wonderful message comes out of a mess that existed. It's, in other words, you cannot have victory without the fight. You can't know him as a healer. If you've never been sick, you can know about him. But you can't know him as a healer unless he has healed you. That's why you must be careful to not preach about something you've never experienced. Because you only have authority over that which you have conquered careful giving marriage advice when you've never been married hey. careful telling someone they need to go on a 21 day fast when you haven't fasted one day oh Woo. I'm so, you know what what happened to me my god Jesus make me grace preacher again all right sorry I'm back gentlemen it comes out of a fight the best messages, the best sermons, the best testimonies come out of the personal encounters that we've had with God in the midst of a storm. And there's a story that comes out of 1 Samuel. Uh, and, and when you're home and you can study it and verify that everything I've said is accurate, or at least 50% of what I've said is accurate, it's somewhere around 1 Samuel and, and chapter 3, 5, 6, 7. The Israelites had what is called the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the presence of God to them it was God on the earth you could say it was a type and foreshadow of Jesus Christ for in Jesus dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily and so they had the Ark of the Covenant and when any time they would go into war they would take the Ark with them anywhere they went they carried the presence of God 
with them. Remember, without him, they were nothing. They were a nomadic people. They had no, they had no identity. They had no place. They had nothing. In him, there was their, their fullness. Everything was in him. And they went to battle one day against the Philistines and lost the Ark of the Covenant. They lost the thing that was the most precious to them. And if that wasn't, if that wasn't enough, the Bible says they lost over 30,000 soldiers in that battle. They lost fathers and brothers and uncles and cousins. They lost, and, and it, was, it, was, it was the epitome of loss. It's one of the greatest defeats that they ever had. And they decided to become content, if you will, living without what belonged to them. For there was no plan of recuperation. There was no plan to get back. They simply said, we've lost. What shall we do now? They lose the Ark of the Covenant. The enemy takes it from them and brings it into their temple where they decide to put it next to their false god named Dagon as, a, as if to make mockery of the presence of God. But when they woke up in the morning, the Ark was standing, Dagon had fallen over. So they said, we have to help him out. Let's pick him up. Up. I'm going to take a time out of my sermon right now and just thank Jesus right now that after 38 years of life I have never had to pick him up but he's picked me up like 32 times every day for 38 years time in so they pick Dagon up dust him off everybody's tall to me you know so I'm just assuming Dagon was tall so they had when I saw Pastor Luke yesterday I'm like God bless you so good to be with you today Pastor Luke they dust off their God. They go to sleep. And when they wake up in the morning, not only has Dagon fallen over again, but he's lost his arms. And it's at that point that the enemy says, we have to give it back. This is a prophetic word for someone in this house. It said, we have to give it back. And the generals start conspiring. And they said, put it on a cart and send it back. Are we going to fight? No, we're not going to fight with them. We're not going to... Put it on a cart, kick the mule, and send it back. No fight, no opposition, because the enemy realized we took it, but what we took doesn't belong to us. Now, I'm not caught up in sensationalism, and so I'm asking that the Lord touch you right now to receive what I'm about to say to you, because I'm not, I'm not tickling emotions. I feel strongly in the Holy Ghost to prophesy that the enemy took something from you, but hell has had an epitome, a, 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 no, an epiphany. They realize, oh, we took it, but it doesn't belong to us. We have to give it back. Hell has realized that your children were dedicated to Almighty God. Hell has realized that there's a blessing upon your money. Hell has realized that you're walking under a covenant. And hell said, well, we took it, but we have to give it back. And we can't oppose them. We can't fight them. We simply have to give it back. I'm prophesying to you that you're about to get back what hell took from you. And you're not going to have to fight for it. You're not going to have to lift a finger for it. All you have to do is receive it. Receive. If that's your word, I'd give God a praise right now. I'm prophesying you're about to get your family back, your marriage back, your money back, your children back, your joy back. You're about to get it back. Woo! Woo! And right when the car, right when they are about to kick the mule, one general came out and he said, no, don't do it yet. You can't send it back like that. Do you know who they are? They're the Israelites. Esos son los israelitas. I think there's a Dominican in the group. Oh yeah, but tú, tú no lo puedes mandar de esa forma. Esos son los israelitas. Those are the Israelites. Do you know who they are? Did you hear what they did to Egypt? Did you hear that Pharaoh? I mean, did you hear? You, you can't do that. No, no, no. You can't just send it back. Have you heard about their God? Did you see what he did to Dagon? No, no. You can't do it. Somebody put gold on that cart. Somebody put some gold. Whose gold? I don't know. Your gold? My gold? I don't know. Give, put some gold. Put some silver. 
on the cart. Put some stuff that doesn't belong to them on the cart. Because I, I, I heard that their scripture says that he'll give them the heathen for thine inheritance. So just go put some gold. Put the silver. I'm prophesying to you that when God does the work of restoration, you're not only going to get back what you lost, but you're going to get something that you've never had before. God's about to bless you greater than what you lost. You're about to walk out with a greater victory than the fight you fought. Because when God does a restorative work, the Bible says, Behold, I make all things new. If you're ready for some gold and silver on your card, if you're ready for some abundance, I'd give God a shout of praise. Now the thing is, Israel didn't have the spirit of victory that Inspire has. Because I feel it. I feel your expectation. I feel that if you saw your child, your wayward child that's walked away from God, I feel like if you just saw him walk through this aisle, I think you'd give God your very best praise. I think that if you woke up tomorrow and you heard that that job you lost last month has come back to you and they said, oh, by the way, you don't just get the job, but you're getting a promotion as well. I feel like you'd praise God like he's worthy to be praised. I feel like if that husband that walked out on you were to come back and say, not only do I love you, but I got you a new car and there's a new house. I feel like you'd praise God like you've never praised him before. But when Israel saw it, they said, that used to be ours. The cart comes back, and they're too nostalgic to receive what God is doing. Nostalgia is a toxic thing if you're not careful. Anytime you're so enamored by what he, get, what he did that you can't step into what he's doing, you're in danger. Anytime, and this applies to everything. This applies to your marriage. Anytime you have to talk about how happy you were 20 years ago, you better get in some couples therapy, like real quick. Hey, you remember how we used to be happy? Ooh, Jesus. So, so the ark tries to come back, and they watch it pass by. Remember when that used to be ours? Remember, hey, Dad, but didn't you say that was our, see, see, yeah, yeah, it, it, well, it used to be ours. I mean, what? I mean, we lost it. We lost it. And they let it pass by by how many know that God's such a good God that when he said something belongs to you even if it passes by he'll go park it over there until you're ready to receive it but as soon as you get ready if he said it's yours there's no devil in hell that can steal it from you again there's no one else that can take possession of it again if God said it's yours then it is yours and after 20 years of living without what belongs to them the prophet the great prophet Samuel came before the people. And I think he spoke Spanish because he said, Ya basta. Enough is enough. I'm tired of living without what belongs to us. If you're tired, we're going to give God a sacrifice of praise and declare that a new day has come. And they felt the spirit of revival come on them. They said, All right, prophet, let's do it. Where, what mountain shall we ascend to? Where shall we go? And he said, let's go back to Mizpah and Shen. Mizpah and Shen is where they lost the Ark of the Covenant. Mizpah means watchtower. He said, we're going back. And someone said, um, uh, prophet, hi, God bless you. Hi, I know you're the man of God and all. Um, yeah, we don't worship there. We, we don't worship there. That's a place of pain. That's a place of defeat. That's a place of bad. We don't worship there. We need to go somewhere new. I mean, can, maybe that mount. I mean, that mountain's kind of nice. No, I've never had anything bad happen to me there. What about over here? This place is nice. Look, there's few musicians right there. I mean, like, let's let's go there. There's already music. The prophet says we're going back to Miswa and Shen. We're going back to the place where you lost it all. We're going back to the place of pain, because if you can praise God here, you can praise God anywhere. You're going to praise Him here. You're going to give God a sacrifice here. You're going to worship God here where it cost you something, where you fought for something. Here in the midst of marriage trouble, here in the midst of financial anguish, here in the midst of everything that has risen up against you, here you will give God your very best praise. Fifteen years ago, they told the mother of my children that she'd never be able to have children. And then came baby number one. And they said, love them, you'll never have another one. Then came baby number two. Said, love her, you'll never have another one. Then came baby number three. We're suing that doctor.
Doctor says, not my fault. I said, yeah, but you said there'd be no babies, my friend. When my, when, my, when my daughter was born, she was born almost nine weeks early. She weighed just three pounds. Her lungs had collapsed. She had no breastbone. Photos are on the internet. You can see them later. And it was a Sunday, and I needed to preach. I needed to, I needed to give a word to the people. And I was watching as they hooked up my daughter to tubes, and they said she wouldn't live. Everyone left the room. It was just the nurse and I. And I said, ma'am, everything's going to be okay, right? She said, Mr. Suarez, you need to be realistic. She's not breathing. She said, someone here needs to be a realist. What's well, a Sunday? I have to preach. I said, God, I can't preach. He said, you will preach. I said, how do you preach? I need to be preached too. How do I prophesy when I need the prophecy? How do I encourage when I need encouragement? He said, Tony, you've been tough on the people. You've told people to praise me when they have cancer. You've told people to praise me when they're at the point of bankruptcy. Now you must practice what you preach. And I, I said, God, I'll praise you like I've never praised you before. But just promise me that you're going to heal the baby. And the Lord said, Tony, have you ever realized that there's always strings attached to your praise? Have you ever noticed that I always have to do something to cause you to praise me? He said, have you forgotten that I am the Lord your God and I am worthy to be praised regardless of what happens on the earth? He said, I call you to worship me regardless of what is happening in that hospital. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you the question that I have asked about 50 churches in the last two years. When is the last time you praise God and it had nothing to do with you? When is the last time you praised God and you said God in the midst of my pain in the midst of my sacrifice in the midst of everything I'm going through I give you praise because in spite of my pain you are worthy to be high and lifted up and I gave God for nine days in that hospital what I learned to be the sacrifice of praise. The sacrifice of praise is when it hurts, when it costs you something, when you don't feel like doing it. But how do you praise when you don't feel like doing it? Because praise has nothing to do with your emotion. Praise has everything to do with your obedience. Psalms 150 verse 6 says, Let everything that hath breath praise ye the Lord. And there is no disclaimer. There's no asterisk at the bottom of the verse. It doesn't say, Let everything that hath breath praise ye the Lord. Unless you're having a bad day, everything's going wrong in your marriage, and there's no money, then you get a free pass. It simply says, let everything that hath breath praise ye the Lord. That means in the good and in the bad, in the happy and in the sad. When you have riches or when you have poverty, when you have health or when you have sickness, let everything praise ye the Lord. For nine days, I would go into the hospital and I'd look at Michael and I'd say, blessed be the name of the Lord. I didn't even feel it. I didn't do it the way, I mean, you see me now. I was saying, blessed be the name of the Lord. I didn't do all that. I just walked in and I said, blessed be the name of the Lord walked out and I'd come in the next day the Lord gives the Lord takes blessed be the name of the Lord and God say praise me I'd say hallelujah Jesus just like that but because there was pain in the offering it was pain in what I was trying to do and I'd look at her and I'd look at him and I'd want to question him for this but I had to recognize and acknowledge who he was and I'd say I love you I worship you I did it for nine days I did it for nine days I kept believing God I kept believing God and there came a point in that time where I got to that place where I could say God I don't know what you're doing here I don't know what you're going to do but in spite of what happens on this earth there's no one like you and I give you my best praise I worship you I love you I lift you up and when your praise is authentic Listen to me when your praise is authentic. You'll feel, you'll feel a boldness come on your spirit. Because after nine days of having my baby in that hospital, and don't worry, I'm not going to do it over you today. I said, God, whether she lives or dies, I worship you. But I read in your word that Elijah breathed over a dead boy. And you raised them back to life not a respecter of persons if you did it for Elijah I believe you can do it for me but if you don't I'll still give you the praise and I said baby in the name of Jesus and 
and when I breathed over my, my daughter, she bounced in that incubator. She had no chest bones before God. The photos are on the internet if you need proof of it. Her chest jumped out and it never caved in again because in one miraculous moment, God formed the breast bones that she needed in her chest. The computer started saying, beep, 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 And the nurse ran in. She said, what happened? I said, I don't know. I don't know. And she came over and she's starting to check something on the computer. She looked at my daughter. She said, it's a miracle. I like it when the doctor has to confess it's a miracle. Somebody should have said, me too, Lord, right on that word right there. Because God is about to cause that to happen for you. I don't know who I'm prophesying. I just felt it to prophesy to someone. You're going to go to the doctor, and the doctor is going to say, you are a miracle. She started pushing buttons on the computer, and she said, this is bizarre. I said, what's wrong? She said, according to the respirator, your daughter is breathing on her own. The machine must be broken. We're going to order another machine. And so they went, and they got another machine, and they wheeled the other machine into the room. And when they were about to connect the tube from this machine to this tube that was down my daughter's throat, my baby girl that was nine days old said, ah -ha, ah -ha spit the tube out of her mouth she'll be 11 years old she'll be 12 years old in March she's never had another tube down her throat she was healed by the power of God and that day God didn't just give me back my daughter he gave me something I never had he gave me a healthy daughter he gave me a miracle daughter and I'm prophesying to you I feel the Holy Ghost I'm prophesying to you that God is not just about to give you back what you lost he's about to sanctify fire he's about to put a miracle on it and you're about to get what you never had before the Israelites went to the place where they lost it all and the prophet said praise God here they're gonna get right with God so they get ready to give him the sacrifice of praise I don't know how you assume the position, but there, you know, I, well, I don't know. I guess Old Testament, you know. Get ready to give God the sacrifice of praise. When the Bible says the hills were filled with Philistines, I'm a visual person. When I read the Bible, I see the movie. I see the movie. It's, not, it's the way my brain works. I'm a very visual person. And so I was reading this story at my home. And I read and I see him. I see him getting in position. I see them getting ready to offer the sacrifice. I see them getting ready to recuperate what they have lost. And then I see the enemy surrounding them. And I said, that's just like the devil. That's the devil. Every time I want to get things right, he comes back. I decide I'm going to tithe and an old bill collector calls me and says you still owe money for your beeper that you haven't had since 1992. I'm going to get my marriage right and some ex-girlfriend calls you after 14 years. Hey, I just want to know what's up. Girl, I wanted to know what's up like 15 years ago. Why you call now? It just seems like every time you want to get something right, the enemy, an antagonistic spirit, a critic, will come back. And I said, because as you can tell, I'm very vocal. I said, that's the devil. My kids ran in the room. Daddy, where's the devil? I'm like, leave me alone. I'm under the anointing. <laughs> that's the devil and God spoke he spoke to my heart he said no it's not I said are you um are we in the same chapter I mean and I'm not being irreverent to God but I said it has to be the devil he said no it's not I said then who caused the enemy to come back you won't believe what he said he said it was me. You? I even forgot English. Tú? And then I wanted to be fancy porque soy colombiano. Vosotros? 
you? Why would you do that? Why would you allow old temptation and enemies? Why would you allow it to come back right when I'm about to get ready to do things right? He said, Suarez, have you not read my word? Does it not say that I will prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemies? Who am I speaking to right now? You suffered in private, but God sent me here to tell you he's about to bless you in public. You cried alone, but God's about to reward you in front of your critics, in front of the gossips, in front of the legalistic crowd. God's about to bless you in front of those that said you'd never be blessed again. God's about to restore your marriage in front of those that said there was no hope. And by doing so, your enemy will have to confess that you are blessed and highly favored of the Lord. stand with me in this house that day no one had to lift a sword no one had to fight because their fight was in their praise they lifted up the sacrifice and the Bible says that God shouted from heaven and God fought the battle for them I'm declaring over you. This isn't hypersensationalism. This is the prophetic word of the Lord. God himself is about to fight the battle for you. You will not have to fight this battle. All you will do is praise through this battle. And as you praise the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of heaven is going to descend and he is going to fight the battle and you are going to recuperate everything. Somebody shout everything. Everything. Every. Somebody shout it again. Everything. You're about to get everything back that the enemy took away. Give God praise.